MMIs are a beast of an interview. They're trying to assess if you're going to be a good doctor or dentist five years down the line. They examine everything from ethics, awareness of the profession, and how you tell someone that you lost their pet budgie whilst they're on holiday. In this video, we talk through the 10 main types of questions which come up in MMI interviews. Hey friends, welcome back to the channel. My name's Rohan. I'm a second year medical student studying at Cambridge University. In this video, we'll be going over the 10 main types of MMI questions, which I see come up time and time again in situations where I've been in actual MMI interviews. So that was Birmingham and Nottingham. I've been on MMI mock circuits and also just through a lot of research on the internet. For those of you who aren't familiar with the term MMI, MMI stands for multiple mini interviews. And this is the most common type of interview format amongst UK medical schools. Usually you will have between six and 10 stations and each station will be five to eight minutes long. The whole point of MMIs is to be more objective. So the theory is that there are more people interviewing you and they usually give you a certain number of points for each station. So the candidates with the highest number of points get the offers at the end. The order of proceedings for this video will be somewhere on the screen. But before we start, this is just a quick disclaimer that I'm not really explaining how to answer these questions. Otherwise, we'd be here all day. Instead, I'm going to outline all the high yield stuff you need to go away and prepare for. If you do this, you're far less likely to be surprised on interview day. Also, be sure to check out my applying to medicine document as I have some extra details about the MMI interviews there. Just some general advice to bear in mind about MMIs. The university website often tells you what skills they are going to be assessing. So be sure to check them out so you can be developing these skills whilst you practice. Sometimes the interviewers in each station won't really say anything. They will just expect you to get on with the task and they'll be quiet. Don't feel put off by this and don't feel that you need to elaborate more. If you finish your answer, you can just end it there. If you suddenly think of something important, let's say after a minute silence, you can go for it. It's completely chill. Just don't feel you have to make up some random waffle to fill up the time. Next, as we touched on before, think of each station as a fresh start. Don't let a bad station knock your confidence. At the end of the day, we can't really control what's gone before but we can control our composure in the current situation. And finally, the skills needed for MMI are very similar to that of a normal panel interview or even an Oxbridge style interview. So be sure to check out my previous interviews, particularly the one on interview technique. Anyway, let's begin with the content and the 10 major themes which usually come up in MMI stations. So these 10 points are in no particular order, but I thought we'll start somewhere easy and that's the personal statement. So there may be a station where they ask you things related to what you've declared on your UCAS application. In this, they'll ask you to elaborate on stuff you've written in your personal statement. To prepare, I recommend that you print out your personal statement with double spacing, then really look at it critically, trying to think what questions they could potentially ask and how you'd answer these questions. Secondly, we need to prepare for what I like to call golden questions. These are the common predictable questions like, why do you want to study medicine? But often these questions are assessing if you have the attributes to be a good doctor or dentist. These include, but are not limited to, empathy, communication, responsibility, teamwork, leadership, organization, being hardworking person, and being committed. For each of these attributes, we need to be thinking of an example of where we observed this and an example of where we have demonstrated this and write a few bullet points around that. We can use these points to prepare 60 to 90 second answers to any question about these attributes which may come up. It's a really good idea to structure your answers using the STAR framework. That is, what was the situation? What did you have to do? So the task, what did you do? The action, what was the result of your action? And the most important bit, reflection. So what you learned from it, what did you learn about the certain quality, that type of thing. Next, we go into medical ethics, which is a biggie. You can guarantee this is gonna come up in some way or another. For this and for interview preparation in general, I highly recommend the book, The Knowledge by Dr. Mona Kuhn. It's a fantastic short book, which will give you a good grounding on all the important topics. For ethics, it's important that we use the four pillars approach to guide our answers. However, we also need to know a little bit about the three C's. So that's confidentiality, consent and capacity and understand some of the theory behind that. For example, do you know under what specific circumstances we can break confidentiality? What constitutes capacity and valid consent? What do we do if someone doesn't have capacity? For example, looking for advanced directives, lasting power of attorneys, and if that's not possible, acting in the patient's best interests. We also really have to nail down the law in the UK over euthanasia, abortion, and consent, and think about what are the major arguments for and against each of these contentious issues. Ethics is most commonly assessed not by straight up asking about the contentious issues, but by testing your reasoning using certain scenarios. There are some which come up time and time again. 
which I'll show somewhere on the screen. It's important that you present both the pros and cons of each scenario and don't go straight in with a biased opinion. Having said that, be prepared to give your opinion and to justify your stance if they do press you on that. But if they don't, feel free just to present both sides of the argument. Communication skills are often assessed in stations where you are asked to give instructions to the examiner. The prototypical question here is to teach the examiner how to tie his or her shoelaces without using any hand gestures. These can be a bit awkward because at times we both know how to tie shoelaces, but it's important we just break everything down into really simple steps and not get flustered if things don't seem to be going the right way. The best thing is to practice some of these examples with other people and to improve your communication skills. You can practice these different tasks which are given on Medic Portal, which has a huge question bank for MMI interviews. I'll leave a link in the description box below which you can check out. Next, we have what I personally think is the most scary station and that's the role play. This usually involves breaking bad news. This is where we come back to the thing I said in the beginning about losing someone's pet budgie because I actually had this in a mock interview once and yeah, I struggled to keep a straight face, which is bad. But they can be more serious, like telling a patient they have cancer, for example. This is obviously an important skill a doctor must have to deliver such news in an empathetic and an appropriate way. There are two frameworks which are helpful for these scenarios. The first is ICE. For ideas and concerns, you can ask the patient what they think is going on and what is concerning them. For expectations, you can ask what they hope to achieve from this consultation. This framework helps to make sure that you and the patient are on the same page going forward. Then, more specifically for breaking bad news, you can use the SPIKES framework. So the S stands for setup. So this means making sure that you're in a quiet room where no one's potentially going to walk in on you guys. P is for perception. So this is to find out what the patient already knows and how they're feeling about the consultation. I stands for invitation. This is asking the patient if they would like to hear everything or just the important bits. K is for knowledge. I'm really not sure why it's called knowledge. This is actually just signposting. So this is kind of showing the early signs that things aren't going to be good. So for example, you could say, unfortunately, I have some bad news to tell you. E stands for empathy, which is acknowledging their emotions. So often there'll be a tissue box. So this is a really good opportunity to show some of that soft person skills and just offer a tissue. And in pre-COVID times, sometimes an arm on the shoulder was a really good way to show compassion to the patient. And S is strategy and summary. So this is you kind of summarizing all the important bits of information and giving a plan going forward how to address the patient's concerns, both in terms of the disease and potentially in terms of like the social repercussions so how potentially other people in the family will be affected. Beware for these stations they'll often use professional actors who will sometimes make a huge fuss like start crying or not say anything and just stay in shock silence. Don't be put off by this. Keep trying to reassure them but most importantly make sure that you get through the framework and you get to the end of the consultation within the allocated time. The main thing that they are testing is the interpersonal skills such as these up on the screen. For these scenarios it is important important to practice seriously, which I know it's hard because friends will sometimes just burst out laughing, but to improve, we actually need to act it out. This is not something we can just read and memorize. Okay, we need to bash through the rest of these. The next is NHS structure. So this is testing your awareness of the healthcare system in the UK. For this, you need to know what the difference between primary, secondary and tertiary care is. We also need to know what the various regulating bodies are, such as the GMC, BMA, NICE, the Royal Colleges, CCGs and the CQC. Most importantly, we need to know about the founding principles of the NHS because the NHS is a huge political success story in the UK and it really is a loved entity within a British society. The two main principles you should be aware of is universal healthcare, that's one, and free at the point of use, that's the second. Next is kind of the current affairs stuff. Obviously this year with the pandemic, the impacts of COVID on healthcare will be huge. Stuff about the vaccine rollout, the impact of different public health strategies. The other big topic is the impact of Brexit on the NHS, for example, staff vacancies. There are some older but high profile cases in the media, such as the Bauer Garber case or the Charlie Gard case which you should be aware of. And finally, stuff like the obesity crisis and the rise of antibiotic resistance are always a recurring theme. Questions about medical history and the future of medicine are less common, but occasionally come up. For the history, the Mona Kuna book is fantastic. Some stuff you could briefly read up on is Jenna and the invention of the vaccine, 
I guess that's quite topical at the moment, or Fleming and the accidental discovery of antibiotics. For the future of medicine, AI in medicine is a big area. Otherwise, stuff like the rise in remote consultations during the pandemic is another area you could look into. There will often be one station testing either basic arithmetic or data interpretation. For the arithmetic one, it'll often be like simple drug dosage calculations such as this one on the screen. Data interpretation might be more tricky as they could show you something which you haven't quite covered in school. The main thing with data interpretation is to use all the data, interpret what they're actually telling you, so it's really important to look at the axis units, comment on the reliability of the data and the validity of any conclusions. Don't be afraid to criticize the data if you feel that it's insufficient. And finally, prioritization tasks are very common. This is because in a publicly funded healthcare system, there'll always be pressure on resources. So we need to prioritize who gets access to them first. A common one I've seen is the following. You're given details of 15 individuals, including their age, sex, and occupation. A nuclear attack is imminent and you're only allowed to save five of them from destruction. Which ones would you save and why? The key thing for this station is just to think through it rationally and not be afraid to maybe make some fairly cutthroat decisions, as long as you can explain your reasoning clearly to the examiner. You can also change your mind about the order of priority. For example, I remember in my Nottingham interview in the prioritization station, I'd done the answer earlier and I was just sitting there. 30 seconds of silence passed then I realized my reasoning was a bit faulty. So I asked if I could reattempt part of it and I was able to give a better answer. So from this, we learned that we need to be flexible with our decision making. So that's all for this video. By preparing for these 10 types of questions, I guarantee you will be well prepared for your interview. Please give this video a like if you found it useful and smash that subscribe button for more content like this. If you are applying to medical school, click on the series somewhere up on the screen over there. This is my applying to medical school series where I give detailed tips right from the UCAT, the BMAT, the person statement and the interview. I'm sure you'll find it useful. Anyway, take care, all the best for the interviews and bye for now.